can live in the Dead Sea. We were told that the Dead Sea is receding about three feet per year and that this produces a lot of sinkholes in the surrounding area. The mountains that you see on the far side of the Dead Sea here, they were in the land of what was called Moab in Old Testament times, but is now the modern nation of Jordan. We also went to Masada. Masada is located on the top of a steep mountain on the edge of the Judean desert near the Dead Sea. Herod the Great built this in, from 37 to 31 B.C. as a desert fortress that he could flee to in case of Jewish revolt. It's about 30, 1,300 feet above ground level. And back then, the only way you could get to the top was by a narrow, windy, one-mile-long path and that made it very easy to defend Masada from a military perspective. But with modern technology the way it is, we were fortunate enough to be able to take a cable car up to the top. But Herod built a double wall around the compound for protection. As you can see in this scale model here, Herod built a three-tier palace for him in the front part here. In the, in, in the back part, there were quarters for the soldiers and their families. And then in the middle part, there were lots of storage areas for um, food and grain, a lot of cisterns for water. And this made it capable of withstanding a very long siege. Now, this scale model that we're looking at, it only covers about 25% of Masada. It, but in, in the back part there, which is not shown there, but here it, it, it was just a wide open area, like a courtyard area that back then was inside these uh, fortress walls. Now, one important thing that we saw in the ruins of so many places in Israel is what they referred to as a reconstruction line. This dark black line that you're seeing here, almost every place where we saw it, it was black, but a couple of places it was white. But anything that's below this line was original construction that was built in ancient times. Anything that's above it was reconstructed in recent times to help give a better idea of what the whole structure actually looked like back then. Now, shortly after the Romans destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD, some of the Jewish rebels um, captured Masada, which at that time was only being defended by just a handful of Roman soldiers. And they made this the Jews' final holdout against Roman authority. And it worked for about three years. But then in 73 AD, Rome sent an entire legion of their army to lay siege to Masada. They built a siege tower, a battering ram, and then broke through the walls and captured it. The ruins of many synagogues have been discovered in Israel that date from around 300 A.D. to later, more recent times. But in contrast, we were told that there's only seven synagogues that have been discovered, the ruins of which have been discovered, that date back prior to 70 A.D. when the temple was destroyed. And we were fortunate enough on this trip to be able to see two of those seven. The first one is here at the top of Masada, which you see in this photo. The second one is in Magdala, and we'll be talking about that later. Masada is not directly discussed in Scripture, but 
we were told that many people believe that based on the descriptions found in 1 Samuel, that David and his band of soldiers hid in this general area for a while during the time that he was fleeing from King Saul when Saul was trying to kill him. We also went to Qumran, which is where the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered back in 1947 in some of the surrounding caves. And you may be able to see a few of the cave openings from this photo. But although Qumran is not mentioned in Scripture, it's still very important in verifying the accuracy of Old Testament Scripture. That's because prior to 1947, the oldest Hebrew manuscript of the Old Testament was the Aleppo manuscript, which was written around 930 A.D. But it was written about 1,300 years after the last Old Testament book was written. The book of Daniel contains a lot of very detailed prophecies that were fulfilled around 150 B.C. during the Maccabean period. Likewise, the book of Isaiah contains many messianic prophecies that were fulfilled by Jesus in the first century A.D. But since there were no surviving Hebrew manuscripts of the Old Testament that were written prior to those events, Skeptics claim that those books and the prophecies they were written in were written after the events occurred and then falsely alleged to be predictive prophecy. Also, since there was that 1,300-year gap between when the last Old Testament book was written and the date of the oldest surviving um, manuscript of the Old Testament, they claimed that there was no way to verify the accuracy of the books of the Old Testament that we have today. They were claiming that they could have been full of transcribing mistakes as they were being copied during that 1,300-year gap. And that as a result, our Old Testament today could be very unreliable. But portions of every Old Testament book except Esther were discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls, including some complete scrolls, such as the Isaiah Scroll. But those scrolls and fragments, they were dated by scholars as being written around 200 B.C., which was before the Maccabean period and before Jesus' earthly ministry. And they were found to be virtually identical to what's contained in our Old Testament today. Virtually all differences were simply misspelled words or words that changed their spelling over time. And this tells us two things. First, we can have a high degree of confidence in the Old Testament scriptures that we have today, that they were accurately copied and transmitted down through the centuries. And second, that those Old Testament prophecies, including the Messianic prophecies, were in fact written before those events occurred, showing that they were genuine predictive prophecy that must have been revealed by God. We also went to Bethabara, which Scripture says was where Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River by John the, the, the Baptist. What you're seeing here in this photo is the proposed site of Jesus' baptism. Obviously, nobody knows for sure the precise location. Now, I'm not sure how wide the Jordan River was back in Bible times. Things can change over the millenniums. But today, the Jordan River is only about 20 feet to 50 feet wide, depending on what spot you're at. In this photo, the nearer bank of the Jordan River is in Israel, which is where we were. And just a few feet away across it was the modern nation of Jordan. We also went to what's called 
Nebi Samuel, which is the traditional tomb of the prophet Samuel. The synagogue that you see in this photo here was built many centuries later, and the tomb is supposedly in the basement level of this synagogue. We also went to the Valley of Elah, which is the likely battlefield where Israel fought the Philistines and the likely location where David killed Goliath. 1 Samuel 17 tells us that the Philistines were camped on a mountain at Sukkah and that the Valley of Elah was before them. The exact location of Sukkah is known today. And the valley of Elah is there before it, just like Scripture speaks of. But this photo shows the valley of Elah with a mountain on each side of it. On the right-hand side that you see here, the mountain actually goes a long ways out, far beyond what I was able to um, capture in this photograph. But this would have been the likely location where the Philistines were camped based on where they would have traveled from, from their home nation of Philistia. The left side would have strategically been the logical place for the Israelites, the army to be, in order to try to stop them. And then somewhere in the valley between them is the probable location where David killed Goliath. Shiloh is, um, we, we, we saw a possible location where the tabernacle stood for about 300 years from the time of the conquest of Canaan by Israel during the time of Joshua all the way up until the time the Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines in battle when Eli was judge over Israel. Ruins of an ancient platform area that's been discovered there is 50 cubits wide, which is identical to what Scripture says. which you see here. And that's one of the reasons why they think this might be the location of where the tabernacle stood during that time. One thing that we were surprised to learn there is that there's only one church of Christ in the entire nation of Israel, and that's the church at Nazareth. After supper in our hotel, we met the preacher of that church. His name is Maurice Jaden. He's here in this photo, and his wife and grandson are sitting beside him, and his son is sitting in the far left side of this photo. But we had a very good discussion with them. We sang songs to praise God. And we gave him an offering to help with the work in that church at Nazareth. It was a very uplifting time to be able to be with them. One thing he was telling us is that Israel places many barriers to churches sending missionaries to Israel to try to convert people to Christianity and establish churches there. This is something that we really didn't expect to learn because like in Costa Rica, we're used to be able to send as many people as we want to to help the congregations down there that we support and help them do mission work. But he said that Israel forbids that, that they will not issue a visa to anyone who's going there to do that type of work. <clears throat> We also went to Caesarea Philippi, which is where Jesus revealed himself as the Christ through Peter's confession. Scripture also tells us that six days after that event, that Jesus went on a very high mountain and was transfigured. We're told that one of the two most likely places where this transfiguration took place would have been either on Mount Hermon, 
which Caesarea Philippi is on one of the lower levels of the Mount Hermon range, or the other location would have been Mount Tabor, which is about 20 miles southwest of the Sea of Galilee. Five times tonight, we're going to be looking at an artist's depiction of buildings which were beautiful and exquisite and elaborate back during first century times and compare them with the ruins of what they look like today and then make application about that in our devotional message at the very end. But we walk through the ruins of the palace of Herod Agrippa II. He was the king that Paul pleaded his case to uh, when he was you know, speaking in the presence of Festus as recorded in Acts 26, shortly before he appealed to Caesar and was sent to Rome. This sign that I took a photograph of, which is just right beside the ruins of this palace, it shows what it likely looked like in the first century based on what the ruins look like today. And these are a portion of those ruins of his palace. One thing that I was very surprised to see just a few hundred yards away from the ruins of this palace was a pagan temple, the ruins of a pagan temple and five or six pagan sanctuaries. They were built around the same general time frame as this um, palace that Herod had built. But it was to worship Greek gods and goddesses. The thing we need to keep in mind is this was still in Galilee where Judaism was dominant. But Caesarea Philippi was also at a major crossroads where a major north-south highway intersected a major east-west highway. And people came from many places throughout the world from a lot of different cultures. And as a result, the, some of the people here were influenced by those different cultures, and a lot of them apparently began paganism, uh, practicing idolatry and building um, pagan altars to worship those idols. But this can serve as a lesson to us even today. Even though we're in the heart of the Bible Belt, where the Lord's church is very, very strong, if we're not careful, we can still be influenced by our culture and gradually begin start departing from some of the things that we're commanded in Scripture. The Sea of Galilee is about 13 miles long and about seven and a half miles wide. And in the deepest part is almost 150 feet deep. Mount Arbel and some of the other mountains that are on the western side are about 1,300 feet above the Sea of Galilee. And this makes it very easy for storms to quickly and unexpectedly come over those mountains and then ravage those who may be sailing on the Sea of Galilee. But we had a very good view of the Sea of Galilee here from the top of Mount Arbel. On the northwest side, right around here, is where Capernaum would be. And we'll be talking about that in just a few minutes. Over here is the town of Genesaret. Right here is the town of Magdala. And we'll be talking about that in a few minutes also. And then right here between, Caesar, uh, between Capernaum and Genesaret is what's called the Cove of the Sower. This is a better view of it, a, um, a photo that I took while we were on a boat ride on the Sea of Galilee. But the Cove of the Sower, people have described this as being a natural amphitheater. 
you, you, you can see you know, the, the hills a little bit higher all the way around it, and then a lower level there. It would make the um, acoustics very good there. But this has been suggested as the likely location where Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount. And Scripture specifically tells us that shortly after he preached that sermon, he entered Capernaum. So we know he was very close to Capernaum when this happened. Directly across the Sea of Galilee on the eastern side are the mountains where Gergesa is located. This was the general area where Jesus healed the demon-possessed man when he sent those demons into the herd of swine, and then they ran down the hill and were drowned in the Sea of Galilee. This view of the Sea of Galilee was at sunset from the shore where our hotel was located. Then, back on the top of Mount Arbel, looking to the west, you can see a um, valley right here between two mountains on each side of it. But our tour guide was telling us that that valley goes back west. If, if you walk a day and a half, you'll come to the town of Nazareth. And he said that the trail that goes to Nazareth from there is called the Jesus Walk. We also went to Magdala. And while we were there, we saw the ruins of this first century A.D. synagogue, which was dated as having been built prior to 70 A.D. It's, it's called the Migdal Synagogue. Now, since Scripture specifically tells us that Jesus traveled to this city, it's very likely <coughs> that he would have worshipped in this very synagogue while he was there. Also, um, you, you may notice um, here on the front part that um, they have some very mosaic tile floor here. Um, very beautiful to see. And then also, one thing that we there was this stone chest type table there. We'll take a look at a, a better view of it. <clears throat> but this is called the Magdala Stone. And it's a replica. The original was taken to the Israel Museum, which is in Jerusalem. But all four sides, as well as the top, were decorated with items that were used in the temple. You can probably see the golden candlestick here. It has seven branches with a three-pronged three base. And it's sitting on what, was, um, what uh, was described as being an altar, um, probably like one that would have been at the temple. But um, ancient, we were told by our tour guide that ancient rabbinic literature speaks of this type of stone table being used quite frequently in those ancient synagogues. But he was telling us that this is the only known example that's actually been discovered. He was saying that during worship, the Torah scroll, which would have contained the first five books of the Old Testament, it would be placed on this table and read to the worshipers there. He said that the custom was to read a portion of the Torah each Sabbath day at a pace where they would finish the Torah in one year's time and then start the process all over again. <clears throat> we, we, we took a one-hour boat ride on the Sea of Galilee in this type of boat that you see here. We were fortunate enough that um, our group was able to have one of these boats all to ourselves. So it made it easy to keep the mood focused on what it might have been like for Jesus and his disciples as they were sailing on the sea. Shortly after that, we went to Capernaum. 
Now, Matthew 4, verse 13, and Matthew 9, 1, it indicates that uh, Jesus left Nazareth and made Capernaum his base of operations for his Galilean ministry. And while there, we saw what's the ruins of what's called the White Synagogue. And it was built around the 4th century A.D. This photo of, on, that was on a sign that, you, um, that was right there at those ruins, it showed what the synagogue is thought to have looked like back then based on what the ruins look like today. And then this is a photo of those ruins. Although it is in ruins, the White Synagogue is perhaps the best preserved ancient synagogue that is in Israel. Virtually all the stones that were used here were white limestone. And we were told that it was built on the ruins of a first century synagogue. And they even had a portion of the floor here removed so that you could actually see part of those ruins of that first century synagogue. But that would have been the synagogue where Jesus likely worshipped at whenever he was in Capernaum. And Scripture, of course, tells us that he was there when he preached the I am the bread of life sermon. Now, as you can see here, the, this, this synagogue had two rows of columns there. And it made it where the design, it would have a large central area here in the middle with smaller side sections on each side of it. Now, the height of those two rows of columns is what um, caused the archaeologist to believe that there would have been um, a second story to this synagogue. And they believe that it would have either been uh, for the women to um, sit at or perhaps just due to the size of the overall um, city. The ruins of first century homes that have been discovered there indicate that they had a population of about 1,500. Another thing that you can probably see here is there's a continuous stone bench all the way on each side of the walls there. This would have been where the worshipers sat. But we were told that the synagogue leaders did not sit on these side benches, but in front. And this seat that we see here, this was excavated in the ruins of an ancient synagogue in the nearby town of Chorazin. And that this might have been the same type of seat that Jesus was referring to in Matthew 23 when he was rebuking the Pharisees for their pride. Uh, talking about how they loved the best seats in the synagogue, wanted to be up front where all eyes would be focused on them, giving them honor and respect. The proposed home for Peter is also in Capernaum. It's about 100 yards north of the Sea of Galilee. Mark chapter 1 verse 29 tells us that Peter and his brother Andrew shared a home in Capernaum. The ruins of this home date back to the 1st or 2nd century B.C., which means that it was definitely in existence during Peter's lifetime in the 1st century A.D. We were told there's archaeological evidence that this home was changed from residential usage <clears throat> to being used for religious purposes in the latter part of the first century A.D., shortly after the commonly accepted date of Peter's death. Most Bible scholars believe he died somewhere around 66 to 68 A.D., now, what you see in the bottom half of this photo is not the ruins of that house, but the ruins of a 5th century church building that was built on top of the ruins of that house to commemorate 
ostensibly what was Peter's home. In the top half of this photo is a, another church building that was built in the 1980s. But as you can see, it was built on an elevated level so as not to cover up or damage or destroy the ruins of that 5th century church building or the ruins of what are said to be Peter's home. <clears throat> we also passed by Mount Tabor as we were leaving the Sea of Galilee heading towards Caesarea. But Mount Tabor, as we were saying earlier, is one of the two probable locations where Jesus' transfiguration took place. And as we were um, traveling by, our tour guide was telling us, he was pointing out a church building. little white dot as far as what we could see. But he said there's a church building on the top that's called the Church of the Transfiguration. We also went to what today is called Caesarea Maritina. But in Bible times, it was simply called Caesarea. Herod the Great built that city between 22 B.C. and 9 B.C. to honor Caesar Augustus, the Roman emperor at that time. And he obviously spared no expense since he was building it to honor the Roman emperor. He built a lavish palace for himself, a couple of temples, a 5,000-seat amphitheater, a marketplace, and what they called a hippodrome, which was oval in shape, which is where they had chariot races at. And it, that hippodrome had a seating um, capacity uh, for 20,000 people. What you see here is an artist's depiction of the grandeur and splendor of Herod's palace. Part of it even extended out into the Mediterranean Sea. This is the ruins of what that palace looks like today. Based on a drawing that was nearby, um, it, um, based on that description um, and on the, these ruins, it appears that there were two sections to Herod's palace. What you, uh, what you primarily see here, the lower palace, it would have been two stories tall. And it's what extended out into the Mediterranean Sea. And it had a large pool in the center of it. And then what they called the upper palace was connected to the lower palace, but it was completely on dry ground. And... Archaeologists believe and Bible scholars believe that the praetorium would have been in that upper palace that was on, completely on dry ground. The praetorium was where pra Paul was in prison during those two years during the time frame of Felix and Festus when they were governors of Judea. When we were in Rome, we went to the catacombs of St. Sebastian. Catacombs were underground burial places that were common around Rome beginning in the 2nd century A.D. because of a change in Roman law that forbade having burials inside the city of Rome itself. We usually think of catacombs as being used by Christians to worship in secret because of the Roman persecution at the time, and that, of course, is true. After that persecution ended in the 4th century A.D., and after Christianity became the state religion for the Roman Empire, the dead were mostly buried in church cemeteries, and so the use of catacombs quickly um, declined in usage at, for burials after that time. What you see in this photo here is of a church building that is, was built over this particular catacomb. 
No photographs were allowed to be taken because um, the Vatican oversees all the catacombs in Rome and they consider the catacombs and tombs to be a sacred site and thus they do not allow photographs to be taken while inside. Our tour guide was telling us there were about 12 miles of tunnels and 70,000 tombs just in this one catacomb. Obviously, what they take us on a tour of is only a, a small fraction of those tombs. But they were, he was telling us that about 30 years ago, the bones in the tombs that the public gets to see had to be removed and taken further back in the catacombs because tourists started stealing them and taking them as souvenirs. When we were in a large underground room about halfway through the tour, we sang a hymn and our tour guide was very impressed by it. He was telling us that one of the things he really missed from his time in the United States was heartfelt singing in worship. He said it's rare to see that in Europe, that in Europe the worship there is very cold and ritualistic. It reminded me of so often how we read in both Old Testament and New Testament scripture God rebuking his followers, those who um, only go through the motions as they worship him, rather than worshiping him with heartfelt worship. We also went to <clears throat> the Arch of Titus. This was built to commemorate Titus <coughs> and his father Vespasian for their victory over the Jewish rebellion in Judea that occurred from 66 to 70 AD, which culminated in the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. The reason why we're you know, spending time on this arch is because it has several engraved panels on it in, in, inside the arch here. And this one here is what I was wanting to focus on. It shows Romans carrying the spoils of war from Herod's temple that they got in Jerusalem. One thing that you can probably make out real well here Harder to see would be the table of showbread and a couple of golden trumpets and a couple of other utensils from the temple that would have been on the table of showbread. The reason why it's hard to see, of course, is because this is outdoors and has been exposed to the elements for about 2,000 years. But our tour guide um, showed us um, a drawing of what this panel would have actually looked like when it was first created. One of the other things we were told was that the Romans frequently deified their emperors after the emperors died. And they were telling us that this Arch of Titus is one example of deifying both Titus and um, Vespasian. The Colosseum of Rome is far and away the most, the most famous structure in Rome. It was built in the shape of an oval, and in round numbers, it would have been about 600 feet long, 500 feet wide, and a, a little over 150 feet tall. The central area where the performances were conducted was about the size of a football field. It also had seating capacity of somewhere between 60,000 and 70,000 people, covered six acres, and was the world's largest amphitheater. As you can see here in this um, artist's depiction, which our tour guide showed us, the exterior had three levels, with each level having 80 arches to it. And at the top, you can probably make out a lot of beams up there. 
but we were told there were 240 evenly spaced beams that were used to support a huge canvas that would be sometimes pulled out whenever it was a very hot day or raining, you know, to cover up the seating area. Our tour guide said it might have been the world's first retractable stadium roof. But the Colosseum was used for public execution of criminals as well as Christians. And that's one of the reasons why we're focusing on it here. But it was also used for gladiator fights fights with wild animals, and various other cultural things. But this is a photo of what the exterior of the Colosseum looks like today. And these are the ruins of the inside of the Colosseum. We also toured parts of the Vatican. The most popular parts are the 24 museum galleries, the Sistine Chapel, the St. Peter's Basilica, and St. Peter's Square. The Vatican museums contain about 70,000 items, many sculptures and works of art and other similar things, many of them being priceless masterpieces. They spared no expense in obtaining those collections. Now, although we would acknowledge that they're beautiful to behold and enjoyable to look at, and even though they're a tribute to the talents that God bestowed upon so many men and women over the years, we can't help but think that this is really not what Christ envisioned His church to be busy doing or what He envisioned so much of the Lord's money to be spent on. Now, the only reason I'm going to be spending a couple of minutes talking about the Sistine Chapel is <clears throat> discussing the paintings of Bible scenes that are on the walls and ceilings of it. The Vatican considers the Sistine Chapel to be a sacred site, and so they strictly forbid taking photographs or even talking in there. They have several security guards in there to enforce those rules. But because of that, all explanations by our tour guide of the meaning of the church's murals had to be done outside. And what you're seeing here is a photograph taken of one of those three large outdoor signs. This is what they allowed us to take photographs of. And I'm briefly going to take a look at three of the photos, three of the murals on this sign this first um, photo is what the interior of the Sistine Chapel looks like. On the left-hand wall here are six mirrors that depict events in the life of Moses. On the side are six mirrors that depict events in the life of Jesus. On the back wall is a mirror depicting the final judgment. And then on the ceiling, there are nine murals as well. But as you can see from this example of one of the murals of Moses, Moses is always depicted as wearing a yellow robe with a green cloak. If there was symbolism associated with that, our tour guide did not tell us what it was. But in contrast to that, Jesus was always depicted in these six murals. cloak and she was telling us that um, this, the red symbolizes Jesus's humanity while the blue symbolizes his deity and then the ceiling had nine murals from the stories of the book of Genesis three from the days of creation three dealing with Adam and Eve and three dealing with Noah and then the last judgment has Jesus near the top of the painting in the clouds. On the bottom left, the dead are being raised from the grave and then ascending to be judged by Him. 
Those receiving eternal life are depicted as remaining with him in the clouds. And then those on the right hand side of the painting, which of course would have been Jesus' left hand, they are depicted as being condemned to hell and being dragged down by demons to hell. We were told that the artist took two liberties with that photo. First, he painted his own face on one of the men that are depicted as being saved, you know, remaining with Jesus in the clouds. But second, for the men that were on the right side of the painting that were being cast into hell, we were told he painted them with the faces of men he did not like. That was his own personal way of condemning his own enemies to hell. But we're out of time, and so what I want to do now is focus our devotional message on 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 4 and 23. Now we already saw an artist's depiction of two palaces and then the Roman Colosseum, which were beautiful and magnificent to behold back in the first century. And then we're not through with it, if you could put it back up. Um, but then you know, we compared them to the ruins of what they look like today. And we're, I'm wanting us to look at two more of these what you're seeing here is an artist's depiction of one of the imperial forums in Rome. We were told it was you know, beautiful and breathtaking to behold, built with so much marble, so expensive, that they spared no expense in building it. And then this was a photo that I took of that same general location, what it looks like today. Likewise, this is an artist's depiction of the western half of the Roman Forum, what it looked like back then. Again, very exquisite, very elaborate. They spared no expense in building these things. And then this is what the ruins look like today. Now in this passage, Peter said that we as Christians have an incorruptible inheritance in heaven that awaits us which will never fade away. We saw so many ruins in both Israel and in Rome. They were once beautiful and magnificent, but then faded away into ruins. Similarly, a lot of old buildings in our own country, the same thing has happened to them. They decay with time. But this is not the case with God or with heaven. They are eternal. Peter tells us that we've been born again through incorruptible seed, through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. And Christ offers us these eternal blessings through obedience to Him and to His Holy Word. But in order to receive these eternal blessings, we must first be found in Christ. And then we must also live a faithful life. There may be someone here tonight who is not yet in Christ by believing upon Him as the Son of God, confessing their faith publicly, repenting of your sins, and being baptized for the remission of sins. Or you may have already done those things, but have not maintained the level of commitment that you believe you should. Or you could simply be going through a difficult trial in your life tonight and you need the prayers of the church for strength. <clears throat> if you have a need that we can help you with, please come now while together we stand and sing. <clears throat>